I'm going to take you through an impossible task here in a half hour or so of about uh, 450 years of a process as a way of trying to penetrate this question of how we remember. Uh, uh, history and memory are not necessarily the same thing, and they can have a vexing relationship, but they have to be combined. Its high walls of dark brown stone stood facing the sea in the front of it. The sound of the ocean waves penetrated beyond its rear walls, which stood watch inland toward vast rainforests, river systems, and the most important trade route in West Africa. The large square structure of Elmina Castle, built by the Portuguese in 1482 and 83, declared by its presence that, and still does, that Europeans had come to the coasts of Africa in the 15th century to do business and to stay. And from its waiting rooms, thousands of African slaves filled ships bound for the Americas, as well as other ports in Africa. Elmina was a crossroads of commerce, culture, and human bondage. Elmina is located on the coast of modern Ghana, as some of you know. The Europeans did not invade the interior. African rulers controlled the countryside and negotiated diplomatic arrangements of mutual commercial interest from the very beginning. The Elmina fortress itself was built by agreement with, the with one of the local African leaders. Within three decades of its founding, business was good, and Elmina was the center of a vigorous coastal trade, largely in Portuguese ships carrying goods Africans desired in exchange for gold, and at first, at least, to a lesser extent, slaves. As the centuries passed, Elmina came under the control of the Dutch and then of the British. Gold supplies waned as slave trading boomed by the 17th century. And by the 18th century, when the British dominated the Atlantic trade, Europeans had built nearly 50 such slaving forts along the huge coast of Africa. By 1710, Elmina alone, and it wasn't even the biggest at that point, launched some 30,000 slaves per year across the Atlantic into the Americas. Its vaulted cellars, wrote one captain in 1732, could easily hold 1,000 slaves at a time. African captives racked with fear and agony, awaiting a strange and unknown destiny. When they saw the ships, they entered a hell in motion, a savage commerce in flesh or what one historian has called the cramped and fetid waiting rooms of history. They could hardly know it, but they were the commodity that fueled the largest forced migration of human beings in modern history. We're a society that always believes it's getting better, and there are reasons for that. We believe in progress. If there's a place in the world that has launched into the human uh, uh, condition this notion of progress, that human societies can be improved and they can get better. The, America has done that. Um, we like to think our history is always uh, like some kind of escalator always going up. Uh, but those of us who study it carefully know it's not quite always the case. Um, and indeed, often not the case. Go ahead with me from Elmina Castle, almost 400 years to the end of slavery, uh, to New Haven, Connecticut, of all places. There were many, 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 many places, hundreds, thousands of places that emancipation was celebrated uh, when it came, whether that was in 1863 on the first Emancipation Day, or whether that was in 64 in, the, in some of the very first uh, commemorations on January 1st of, Emanci of the Emancipation Proclamation or the following year. This particular case comes from January 1st, 1865. The Civil War is still on, of course, but in New Haven, Connecticut, the AME Bethel Church was decked out on January 1st to celebrate the Emancipation Proclamation, this brand new Declaration of Independence or this brand new document of freedom. There was religious fervor mixed with patriotism as perhaps never before in that particular free black community's history. 
The Reverend S. V. Berry made a speech in which he linked the Proclamation of Emancipation to, as you would guess, the Declaration of Independence in the same unified history now. To great applause and just before the singing of O oh, Be True to Our Flag, Berry concluded with the idea that all present could now at least entertain. The time is fast approaching, he said, when we as citizens of the United States will be respected as such. Let me reflect for just a few minutes back on this question now of history and memory. Our individual memory, in essence, makes us human. I mean, it separates us from other species. We, we know that. As soon as we begin to talk about collective memory, group memory, social memory, national memory, the international memory of the slave trade. It gets elusive, doesn't it? It gets, it gets messy. It gets unsystematic. How do you know a collective memory when you meet one? What constitutes a memory community? Sometimes that's easily, easily identified. It might be the people in a given church on a Sunday morning. They're a memory community. They, they, they share a theology, they share a, tr a liturgy, a tradition, a practice. Other memory communities are larger, institutions, universities, towns, nations. All nations have creation stories. All nations are in some ways the narratives, or as someone said earlier, the stories they tell about themselves. What is a story but a narrative developed over time as a kind of collective memory? But let's make a couple distinct, a few distinctions between history and memory, just for definitional purposes. History, if you like, is what trained historians do, or what trained history teachers do. It is a reasoned reconstruction of the past rooted in research. It tends to be critical and skeptical of human motives and actions, and it is therefore more secular than what people sometimes refer to as memory. History can be read by or belong to everyone. It's therefore more relative, more contingent upon place or chronology or scale or other matters. Memory, however, is often treated as a sacred set of potentially absolute meanings or stories. Don't take my story away from me. Don't criticize my story. It is sometimes possessed memory as a heritage or the identity of a community, and hence its power. Memory is often owned. History gets interpreted. Memory is passed down through generations. History just gets revised. Memory is oft often coalesces in objects or sacred sites or monuments. History seeks to understand context and all the complexities of cause and effect. History asserts the authority sometimes of academic training and recognized canons of evidence. Memory carries the often more powerful authority of community membership and experience. Or as Pierre Norau once put it, memory dictates while history just writes. A way of thinking about history and memory, at least to try it on, is that they're like two attitudes toward the past or two streams of historical consciousness that at some point have to flow together. But sometimes they cause turbulence when they flow together because they're not necessarily the same thing. Now what historians studying social memory or national memory have come to simply understand is that the process by which nations or societies remember itself has a history. So we're trying to write histories of memory, and it is in part what we're doing these days with the memory of slavery. Well, why is slavery such a vexing problem in our memory? Uh, it has to do with 250 years of an institution, of course, that has been discredited by the world, and we were responsible for it. But it's never been easy to shoulder up to that responsibility in a society, again, that believes its history is essentially about progress. Where do you fit the story? of 250 years of slavery? Where do you fit a horrible civil war of such enormous loss and death and destruction into a story of progress? But where do you fit that war into our national master narrative? 
Where does slavery fit in our national master narrative? The Civil War, Emancipation, and Reconstruction, if you can put that whole era together, the era of the end of slavery and the challenges of its legacies, were a kind of anguished birth, or as Lincoln put it, rebirth, of a second American Republic. It was, in some ways, a second American revolutionary era. If by that we mean the redrafting of, the rewriting of, the rethinking of the Constitution. The Civil War results, of course, in the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendments, the Great Reconstruction Acts, the first Civil Rights Acts in American history, the transformation of the right to vote, the transformation, at least the beginnings of the transformation of the idea of equality, and certainly the transformation of that word the Reverend used here in the AME Church in New Haven in 1865 of citizenship. It brought us our first citizenship law ever in our history. Now, there are a lot of ways to look at our memory of this period. In this book I did called Race and Reunion, I divided, and this is just a way to, to get your head around it. There are other ways of doing this. But I divided American memory of slavery, the Civil War, and its aftermath into three kinds. And it's at least a way of talking about it. The first kind of memory that developed, you might call the reconciliationist memory. It took root in the process of dealing at the time with the dead uh, from so many battlefields and hospitals and prisons, those 620,000 dead that affected virtually every family in America. It developed this reconciliationist vision earlier than the bitter history of Reconstruction has sometimes allowed us to believe. A second kind of memory you might call the white supremacist memory. Now, this took root very early in the wake of emancipation and the war. It took root in terror and violence. It took root in the South's counter-revolution against Reconstruction. It took root in the Black Codes, which were written, of course, within the first year after the war. And a white supremacist vision of the meaning and memory of slavery, emancipation, and the Civil War delivered the country by the 1880s, 90s, turn of the 20th century, a segregated memory of that experience. And a third kind of memory you might call the emancipationist vision or emancipationist memory. It was embodied in African Americans' own complex remembrance of their own freedom. It was embodied in the politics of radical reconstruction as long as it lasted. It was embodied in this conception I just referred to earlier of the Civil War as the reinvention of an American Republic and the liberation of blacks to citizenship and the possibility of equality. It was embedded in the very idea that the central result of the Civil War was the destruction of slavery and the responsibilities to do something about it. Now, those three kinds of memory were not always distinct. They often flowed into one another. Sometimes they marched together. Now, what Americans faced, and in many ways we still do, at the end of the Civil War and in the aftermath of the end of slavery, was, if you like, two awesome tasks. They had to understand the tangled relationship between two profound ideas. One idea was the necessity of healing and the other idea was the necessity of justice. Both of these had to occur somehow in America in the wake of the Civil War and emancipation. But these two aims of sectional healing, and for that matter, human healing, and racial justice, these two aims never developed in historical balance for at least the 50, 75, 100 years after the end of slavery. And it's that legacy, of course, that we're, we're still facing, we're still dealing with, we're still trying to figure it out. Americans, simply put, have had to work through the meaning and memory of slavery and of the Civil War in the only place we could, and that's in the politics of memory. And as long as we have a politics of race in America, we're likely to have a politics of the memory of slavery and a politics of Civil War memory. Let me end with just one story, just to illustrate, if I can, 
what happened to the memory of slavery. But so much of what happened to the memory of slavery, as, as many of you I'm sure may know, is that it became sentimentalized. It became romanticized. The memory of slavery in America floated by the late 19th century into a kind of never-never land of the plantation school of American literature. Or they would have old plantation days. They would have mammy days where they would commemorate and honor old mammies and old slaves. It was much easier to sentimentalize this story than to face it. If you want to understand what had happened to the memory of slavery and of the Civil War, one of the best ways to look is at the largest blue-gray reunion of Civil War veterans that ever occurred. It occurred at Gettysburg on the 50th anniversary of the battle, July 1st to the 4th, 1913. They gathered 53,000 veterans at the old battlefield. About two and a half million dollars was allocated by the federal government through the War Department and by the states to put on what was called from its inception a festival of harmony, a peace jubilee as it was billed. It was to be a public avowal of a glorious fight that led to greater unity. And every governor of every state attended, many of them still former Civil War veterans, and they all spoke, and they basically all spoke in the same tones. There had never been such a spectacle, if you like, of resolution and patriotism vis-a-vis -vis the past quite like this. It was covered by the press all over the country. There was no time or space allowed anywhere in this four-day festival, spectacle, for any discussion of the causes or the consequences of the war. There was no talk whatsoever of emancipation, which was, of course, the other great 50th anniversary that was going on at that time, particularly in black communities. And there were hundreds of emancipation celebrations that year all over the United States, south and north. There was no consideration whatsoever of Reconstruction. White supremacy, if you like, might be said to have been a kind of silent, invisible master of ceremonies at this Gettysburg reunion. At a time when lynching had developed into a social ritual of its own horrifying kind, the NAACP counted 70 of that year alone. The Peace Jubilee at Gettysburg, this national reunion, to commemorate the war was a Jim Crow reunion. There's absolutely no evidence that any black veterans attended or that they were welcome. On July 4th, the last day of the reunion, the main speaker was Woodrow Wilson. He's just been recently inaugurated president that March. He's the first president since the Civil War born in the South. He wanted nothing to do with coming to this Gettysburg Blue Gray reunion, but he came they, whisked him into, they brought him into town on what today we call a flying visit. So they went into a huge tent that housed about 15,000 of the veterans on bleachers. He went in and he gave his speech. Wilson declared it in his words, an impertinence to discourse upon how the battle went, how it ended, or what it signified. And then he used a refrain. He said, what have the 50 years meant? He's referring to the 50 years since the end of the war. What have the 50 years meant? And then he answered and struck the mystic chord of memory, if you like, that most white Americans were prepared to hear. Quoting Wilson, they have meant peace and union and vigor and the maturity and might of a great nation. How wholesome and healing the peace has been. We have found one another again as brothers and comrades, how complete the union has become, and how dear to all of us, how unquestioned, how benign, and majestic, as state after state has been added to this, our great family of free men. The veterans applauded. He came off the stage, put him back in the car, back to the train, off to vacation in New Hampshire. He spent one hour in Gettysburg. The Civil War and all that it meant and remember, slavery was never mentioned at that event. The Civil War and all that it meant had become thus a quarrel forgotten in Jim Crow America. A nation can have too much memory, but a nation can also forget too much. <laughs>